Well, good evening to everyone. It's customary to say it's a very great pleasure, but it really is a special pleasure in this horrible time of the pandemic to actually have people physically present, even as we're doing a live streaming event. And we've gone to great trouble to make sure that those who are with us uh, via electronic means uh, feel that you are with us and able to participate in this very special event tonight. I'd like to um, thank the Eunice family uh, for actually long friendship that goes back to my own previous service uh, when I was in Cairo for making this event possible. And this event comes in the context of much else that you make possible through the Nadia Eunice Memorial Fund that helps uh, in educate and inspire rising generations of young people at our university to follow in the footsteps of this pioneering Egyptian stateswoman who dedicated her life to the service of humanity through a career in the United Nations uh, international uh, diplomacy uh, through an international organization, very much like our guest of honor tonight. Um, this is the 14th anniversary of this lecture series made possible through the generosity of the Eunice family and those who have contributed as well to the fund, those others who have uh, contributed in memory of Nadia Yunus. Um, this lecture series aims to bring together uh, people at AUC that is part of our mission, bringing people together from across the world, uh, prominent figures in global policy, politics, economics, culture, uh, to discuss critical issues of our times. And then, of course, there is no more critical issue right now uh, across the globe than the one that our guests of honor will be addressing on the, the impact of COVID-19 on the way we live now and what's coming. This commitment to serving the global community, serving humanity, the dedication and the visionary leadership are the principles really that Nadia Yunus herself lived and exemplified and, and uh, demonstrated in every moment of her professional life. They're the ones that we do hope to instill in our rising young leaders at AUC. That makes us particularly proud that Her Excellency, Minister Sigrid Kag, is an alumna of ours. Uh, she graduated, in fact, from uh, AUC, was not, uh, not only an exchange student, but graduated from AUC. She's shown a great example of what we like our students to demonstrate. Uh, we're also very proud that we uh, graduate a lot of women leaders. And of course, uh, she has been one in her field of uh, diplomacy, whether in her own country's government um, or in international organizations, um, uh, different, different agencies of the United Nations and all the garden spots of the world, lots of places with very fascinating and uh, even risky missions, most recently as Under Secretary General serving in Syria on the uh, chemical weapons uh, uh, issue there, but also spanning service from Nairobi to Khartoum, uh, Geneva, Amman, uh, Jerusalem, so uh, New York, of course. So this is a, an exceptional international public servant. Uh, her Excellency is dedicated to finding solutions to some of the world's most pressing issues, education in war and other crisis zones, gender equality, women's rights, a strong advocate also for mental health issues and uh, mental health awareness. They all kind of come together in the, uh, in the uh, question of COVID, of course. Uh, Ms. Kag was awarded the Carnegie Watala uh, Peace Prize in recognition of her efforts and results of her work, particularly in the Middle East. So we're very honored to continue this lecture series tonight uh, with her uh, uh, as our guest of honor. And uh, again, carrying forward the living memory of the, uh, Nadia Yunus. Representing the Yunus family tonight, I've, I've uh, said hello to uh, several of the members. I don't know if I've, I've seen all who are here. Malik Fuad will be speaking for the entire uh, family and uh, we'll take on from here. Malik, would you come up and uh, take on the uh, program, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Ricciardoni, for your welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us for the 16th year of the Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture Series. We are delighted to welcome so many friends, both here in AUC's Oriental Hall and virtually all around the world. Starting in 2004, our aim in setting up this lecture series was to keep Nadia's memory alive. 
We believed then, as we believe now, that the best way to do that is by inspiring Egypt's next generation of public servants to try to make the world a better place. Never has that aim seemed more urgent and needed than today, in the midst of this cataclysmic pandemic. We are living through a once in a lifetime generation schism taking place on a global scale. We have never faced a truly global crisis such as this one, and going forward, we must find the tools to shape a better environment for our children and grandchildren. Many of you here in this room and watching from far have been loyal friends, donors, and colleagues who have been on this journey with us from the very beginning. As you know, we have been lucky to have, host, to have hosted an incredible roster of dignitaries. From Kofi Annan, who delivered our first lecture series in 2004, just one year after the horrendous attack that took Nadia from us, to last year's insightful and entertaining talk by Jamie Nushafi, we have covered many interesting topics over the years. Our criteria for choosing our speakers is quite simple. We ask ourselves three questions. Are they inspirational? Can they offer deep insight into key global issues? Do they represent a positive role model for young Egyptians looking to make their way in the public sphere? This year's speaker ticks every box and more. We are delighted to welcome Sigrid Kag as our 2020 lecturer. Her incredibly diverse background, which ranges from her work with refugees in the Middle East to her current role as Dutch Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, means that she is uniquely positioned to talk to us about the challenges facing our region during and after the pandemic. These are issues that will touch every one of us, whatever our age and wherever we live. How can we come out of the current situation and build a better future for all? This is the fundamental question we have to address. In closing, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our donors for their generosity and continued support. It's because of them that, we're able to, that we are able, 16 years from when we began, to still bring you inspirational speakers. Perhaps a silver lining in our new virtual reality is that our friends around the world can be with us today in real time, a first for our memorial lecture series. I would like to extend my family's appreciation and gratitude to Shadan El Khatib and her wonderful team here at AUC for putting our events together each year. They have been doing a sterling job. Finally, I would like to express our sincere thanks to... I'd like to express our sincere thanks to President Richard Doni, who will be leaving AUC next year. The Eunice family wish him all the best in his future plans. I'll now hand over to Karim Hageg, who will act as Master of Ceremonies and Moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Malak. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Karim Haggag. I am a professor of practice at the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the American University in Cairo. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker for this evening's Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture. The Dutch Minister of Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, Her Excellency Sigrid Kaag. Minister Kag was appointed Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation in the Third Root Government in the Netherlands in October of 2017. Before assuming her current position, Minister Kag has had a long and distinguished career in diplomacy and international public service. Minister Kag began her professional career working for Royal Dutch Shell International in London and subsequently at the UN Political Affairs section of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She subsequently held a series of international positions, including program manager and head of donor relations at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, in Jerusalem, and the International Organization for Migration in Geneva. Minister Kog 
was also a senior UN advisor in both Khartoum and Nairobi, and she continued her career at UNICEF, where she held various positions, including deputy director of the program division and chief of staff in New York, and regional director for the Middle East and North Africa in Amman. She then served as assistant secretary general for the UN development program in New York. More recently, as UN Undersecretary General, she led the mission to eliminate chemical weapons in Syria after that country joined the Chemical Weapons Convention in 2013. After this mission was completed, she was appointed UN Undersecretary General in Lebanon with responsibility for all UN activities in the country, specifically the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which was adopted to bring the 2006 war in Lebanon to an end. In recognition of her many efforts in support of peace and development in the Middle East, Sigrid Kog was awarded the Carnegie Waterloo Peace Prize in 2016. Minister Kog received an honorary doctorate from the University of Exeter and of particular relevance to tonight's event, as was mentioned by President Richard Doney, she obtained her BA in Middle East Studies from the American University in Cairo in 1985. This is a mark of distinction for AUC and indeed a source of pride for the university to include her among our many distinguished alumni. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture Series is dedicated to provide a global perspective on issues affecting Egypt and the Middle East, and to provide a platform for innovative thinking about the solutions to address these many challenges. It is with that purpose in mind that tonight's lecture is titled, COVID-19's Impact on the Middle East, What Now and What Next? And we are especially privileged to welcome someone of the experience, stature, and knowledge of our region as Her Excellency Sigrid Kag to address this pressing issue and to deliver tonight's Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture. Minister Kag, it's a pleasure to welcome you virtually uh, to this occasion. Thank you again for joining us. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hagag. Um, President Cardoni, um, members, of course, of the Yunus family, professors, students, ladies and gentlemen. I'm truly delighted to be back in Cairo, even though I had hoped to be there physically, of course, but uh, many of us dream and I think one day they'll come true again. Uh, the 14th century Arab historian Ibn Khaldun wrote that the past resembles the future more than one drop of water resembles another. This may have been true once, but times have changed. In our present age, the steps we take as individuals echo along the paths we take as societies. It's true through these countless steps that we see the world change around us. And some individuals leave footprints so deep, so powerful, that many choose to follow where they lead. Nadia Yunis left such footprints. In the words of former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, spoken here at the first memorial lecture, Nadia, she brought with her everywhere a special Arab brand of enlightenment and tolerance only to fall victim in the end to a special brand of extremism and intolerance. She lived for the United Nations and the ideals for which it stands. Ultimately, she died in its service. But I believe that this hope, as well as the tragedy, are why ya Nadia Yunus has inspired and will continue to inspire so many others. And she has also inspired me. Unfortunately, I never had the pleasure of meeting Nadia, uh, meeting her in person, but the steps, her steps echoed through the United Nations also while I worked there. And I've heard countless stories of joy, of fun, and her special small decisions and the bigger ones that I feel as if I've almost met her and have spoken to her. There is of course a reason she's remembered so fondly and so strongly. She lived her life to the fullest while spending it in the service of others, unfailingly so. She was known to be a tough and determined diplomat who could also light up the room with her devious sense of humor. It was said she would tell Bill Clinton where to stand and Vladimir Putin what to wear. And I think the Eunice family knows many more of such anecdotes. 
Her untimely death was deeply tragic and a real loss to the international community, to the United Nations family, and of course, to the Eunice family and her friends. But perhaps there's some redemption in the warmth and devotion with which she is remembered. It shows that in a sense, she never leave, really left us. And I think many of us hope can, can only hope and aspire to leave the marks that Nadia Yunus left on the environment, community, and the region she served. So it's an honor to speak here today and to pass and to share some ideas on global politics, on the impact of COVID. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I may never have told President Putin what to wear or former President Clinton where to stand, but like Nadia Yunus, as was recalled, I had the pleasure of being a graduate of the American University in Cairo in 1985. And I still remember the excitement I felt and I asked Professor Haggad when we spoke before when I first walked into campus, of course, the old campus, Oriental Hall, I remember it well. The days of my graduation sadly also feel like yesterday, but it's not so. But I've also had the privilege being equipped with an ed AUC education to try to pioneer my own little way and claim a part of a responsibility on the global stage as a junior official working my way through. And I feel AUC has equipped me to do so. And it's wonderful to be back in Cairo, albeit on screen. And of course, I'm reminded of the Egyptian song, Fiha Haga Helwa, Fiha Haga Helwa, Haga Helwa Bena. I will not belabor the rest, but there is something special and beautiful about all that is Egypt and that makes you want to return it. It's also made me build a special tie to the Middle East, a deep connect and a connectivity. And I've always had a privilege in spending my working life uh, being in the Middle East and at the service of peace and development of this special region and it's even more special people. But where are we today? Because this region has also been affected by the COVID pandemic. It's brought many of the issues to the foreground. I was initially asked to speak about the pandemic and the future beyond, hence the title of this lecture. What's now, but more importantly, what's next? Now let's start with the now. COVID of course, COVID-19 is impacting, is affecting all of the world societies, economies, communities. We're all deeply impacted. But of course, many countries that have the coping means, the system in place, the system of governance, the economy, such as my own, are much more positioned to deal with the impact of a pandemic than so many other societies, be they developing or middle-income countries. But one thing that unites us all is the pain and the suffering that all families have felt at loss or the pain of seeing an empty seat or having to care for a convalescing, convalescing relative. Loss is what unites us. Loss is also what ties us as humans. But in the, in the essence, in the now as well, we've seen economies come to a grinding, almost immediate halt as the world collectively redirects its efforts to fight the virus. We started, of course, working it from a health perspective, but seeing very much that whilst we can deal slowly but surely with the impact of the health crisis, the ramifications of COVID-19 through lockdown after lockdown, through economic breakdown and turndown, are far more reaching and beyond the impact of health alone. The singular most important effect of the pandemic has to highlight the deeper systemic challenges also of this region, economic and of course also political as the two are intertwined. COVID-19 to my mind has only compounded the challenges that this region has faced before, but it can also create a pathway out of a structural crisis of underdevelopment, oppression, restrictions, be they social and political. Structural issues, as you know more than anyone, have existed with regard to frailty, fragility, democracy, governance, and of course, the way they relate in particular to the well being and rights of vulnerable people, communities, ethnic uh, people of a specific ethnic, ethnic background, or mere citizens as they are confined in the realization of their human and economic rights. It will not be any surprise to you that I say and uh, that many Middle Eastern governments, past and present, uh, through Arab Spring and beyond, maintain a poor record 
in the field of human rights when it comes to the rule of law and governance, which has only served to increase tensions and reduce the trust in government policy and political choices made. This is a very tough elephant and a big one in the room. The current pandemic places additional strains on social and political systems, but that strain largely serves to exacerbate problems that were already there before. But we've also seen in many other countries, in the African continent in particular, that many governments have tried to usurp the element of crisis that Corona or COVID-19 has put before them or has offered them to actually usurp more power and to reduce the democratic and political space open to its citizens. We've seen this before under previous crises. One element, of course, of COVID-19 is that it has widened existing divides and it has deepened existing inequalities. Now, uh, um, um, a starting student, an undergraduate student would say, yes, we know this. And the tough part is we know it, but how can we seize the opportunity in this deep crisis to redress, to remedy, and to really move towards a transformative agenda that is so much needed and yearned for by so many people, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa. If we look at the statistics alone, the Middle East and North Africa region ranks lowest in the most recent economic, Economist Dem Democracy Index, challenging geopolitical circumstances, economic stagnation, and endemic corruption afflict many states throughout the region. All of these factors, of course, continue to feed unrest, public unrest, which of course, from time to time erupts into public protest. The strain of discontent and marginalization is therefore always present. A similar picture emerges from publications like Freedom House or Our World in Data, both of which rank countries on a number of social, economic, and political indicators. The MENA region has for several years running, actually I can't even remember when it didn't run in this statistic, ranked in the lowest percentiles for economic freedom, press freedom, and of course, women's rights. Women's rights being often the lens through which you can measure a wider range of, human, uh, of economic and political rights. And in its most recent report on the MENA region, the World Economic Forum concluded, the region was structurally and remains structurally dependent on energy revenues, making it even more vulnerable to price fluctuations. Now, I know in Egypt, you could uh, equate uh, tour oil or fossil fuels with tourism alongside and the dependency and the, the fragility is even greater. The report, of course, also continues to note that unemployment and underemployment remain issues in most countries in the Middle East, compounded by fiscal problems, violent instability, and the long-term impact of climate change. All these are a very toxic possible combustion, and they pose new current and new risks to the region. So against this background, we need to take a step back and say, my Lord, my, we've got this already. And what does the pandemic do to add further so-called fuel to the fire? The damage is considerable, even just in economic terms, as you know, um, and I do not mean to give a depressing lecture, but the outlook remains fairly dire. The IMF projects that the decline, of course, of GDP will be by over 4% this year alone, and it's the lowest forecast for this region in 50 years. Now, there are, these are worrying numbers, but of course, it's more concerning how they, are, how they make people feel, because the biggest burden will always fall in any society on those who are already vulnerable, marginalized, and without coping mechanisms, without stable work, without a living income or a living wage, access to housing, decent housing, or schooling, adequate schooling for their children, for their children or themselves in terms of the skill space they need to survive and to live. This will be felt in refugee camps, amongst migrant communities, and amongst the many other citizens who actually have to deal with the impact of this crisis. And the region alone, of course, on the one hand, is so known for its generosity, its hospitality, and its willingness to always take in refugees, to house in more than 16 million internally displaced and refugees for years and years. And sometimes while countries in the West with significantly greater resources look away and choose to act differently. 
This renders, of course, vulnerability. Um, this takes vulnerability to a very different level. And it's particularly worrying when we also know that the strain the pandemic puts on host countries, hosting communities uh, that actually provide the healthcare and social services for the most vulnerable, it actually puts a strain that makes, that makes the future very dire. It gives a somber perspective and it actually puts a strain on people's ability to see a way out. It also reduces the, the space for governments to take decisions, dealing both with the IMF, dealing with their fiscal restrictions and dwindling resources. So it's a tough nut to crack. Um, but services, access to services, to good healthcare, to education, these are not only rights, it's not just a theoretical issue, it is a, it's lived and felt by people day in, day out. It's also part of, of a realization of one's individual rights in terms of the future you want to build. So we see the pandemic as a, as a looking glass on the one hand, and on the other hand, as the biggest accelerator in our era, in our generation of inequality and inequity with, with traditional means to actually try to bridge. This of course is also a question we all need to ask ourselves, what is the way we can reset, we can redress, and we can actually fast forward our way out of this pandemic, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, knowing the systemic issues that are also at heart. The gender lens of the impact of the pandemic is very clear. Whatever happens, the same setting, the same situation, women are significantly greater affected than men. Girls, significantly greater than boys. And uh, women, of course, uh, risk falling prey to sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, but of course also being potential victims of domestic violence when the socioeconomic situation in the household is not particularly uplifting. More than half of the global female workforce in the Middle East and North Africa still works in the informal economy. Not registered, no unemployment benefits, no protection, no safety nets. As they're not registered, they don't qualify for any assistant. And of course, as we know, when the economies shut down, when they reduce, uh, when, they are, when they are shrinking, this group is most particularly affected and as a result, even more vulnerable. Even before COVID-19, almost 37% of Arab women had experienced violence in their lifetime. So it's a statistic that should actually cause us to pause and say, are we seeing everyone that is vulnerable in our society? And what can we do to protect? Legislation is one, but it's the actions and the services that we can extend to them that gives the greater benefit in the immediate term. Now, when we look at children, of course, and the generation, the young people, when I was a student in Cairo, I already realized that anybody who could afford to study at AUC was privileged. Uh, despite the scholarships that were generously extended, most young students at AUC came from a privileged background and it was the dream, it was an oasis in a desert where so many other young people in Egypt were aspiring to be successful in school, were hoping to be able to study at the state-run universities. So education, as we know, is the biggest factor in one's individual emancipation if all other socioeconomic barriers are not there. But what's happening in the midst of this pandemic to school children? All children who ought to be learning in the formal or informal school system. We know that millions and millions of children also in the MENA region have stopped going to school, have been prevented from exercising their right to an education because their parents can't afford the fees or they can't afford the simple daftar, the little notebook, or they can't afford um, the subscription or perhaps the teacher who needs to make a little bit of money on the side because the state salary isn't enough. So you pay a little bit of extra to the teacher at the back of the door for your child to have a seat or maybe share the desk with the 45 other children in that same school space. All these are very tough choices when you're poor, but we, we all know what ends up happening, that children are opting out of school or their, chair, their parents are faced with a very stark choice to not have their children learn. So the risks of this pandemic over and above all the other issues that I cited are creating, is a risk of creating a lost generation. 
And from the very privileged and luxurious background almost of the Netherlands, where children are learning online, we've also seen that even though you can follow in your entire school curriculum online, there is a loss of learning, of being in the classroom, socializing together, learning to, learning to be in a team, that the world doesn't evolve around you. But this is the privileged end of the spectrum. For most young people, children, the dream, the dream is to be in school, to be at school, to leave school with a, with, a, with, a, with a certificate and a certificate actually that stands for something. What does this mean for young people subsequently? In all this, this region, sadly still mired by conflict, new conflicts uh, and chronic conflict also since the Arab Spring, young people apparently want to leave a region where actually they want to give back, they want to invest, they want to be close to their family, be part of their culture. A recent survey showed that nearly half of young people in the Arab world have considered emigrating. A third has indicated that the pandemic, this pandem the pandemic has triggered them to take more steps towards that. And of course, for many of them, we know the journey towards immigration is actually irregular migration, taking high risks, the risk of being trafficked, being exploited and being abused. At, and being at the hands of smugglers who certainly do not think of the human rights agenda. It's an abusive and a corrosive business model. It's illegal and it puts people in serious harm. But when people are desperate, they're often prepared to take desperate measures. And this is the time, of course, that is particularly, this is particularly concerning as the region is, is, is growing so rapidly. The population has quadrupled in the half century and is expected to double again in the next 30 years. So there's a young population. It's often described as the youth bulge. I find a bulge often sounding a little bit as excess weight. So I'm still trying to find the appropriate demographic uh, description, but uh, an abundance of youth can only bring tremendous dividends if there is the right channel, the, the right channel made available to, to young people through education, through the new jobs, through the types of skills that they need to thrive, to drive and set their own agenda for their own future. And of course, young people help a country to innovate, to think new, think out of the box. And if given the opportunity to revitalize uh, atrophied economies, it hasn't been the case yet. Um, here, I, I would like to pause for a second because in the years I've worked in and out and for the Middle East, uh, it's been a recurrent theme, how to generate the type of skills and build the curriculum that provides young people with the skill set, the uh, intellectual uh, baggage to make it to the new job market. As we know, uh, east or west, north or south, the jobs of the future are not known to us yet, but many jobs in most sectors will disappear. And so we need to be able to regenerate ourselves. We need to be equipped to keep learning and to move from job to job. But this is a type of luxury that most young people in the Middle East and North Africa could never aspire to have. But they are out of, out of work, out of hope, out of perspective. And this is, I believe, is the particularly biggest challenge alongside the pandemic as it leads to instability, it undermines society. If young people are left on the streets um, in Algeria, as you know, there was young people would describe themselves when asked, what is your job? They say, Je suis hétiste, al -hét. I'm a wall, I'm, I lean against the wall and it's become a noun. And that tells you how deeply ingrained the issue and the problems are within most uh, societies and economies. But then what's next? Because these are the so-called known knowns and sadly they've been debated, they've been analyzed, they've been assessed for a long time. Where do we take it from here? For young people, with young people, in support of young people. It may have been dispiriting, uh, our collective failure to drive an agenda that is big, thinks at scale and sets, set, pa paves a way for economic transformation that is real and that yields success. One thing we know is we need to build on the power of young voices, of young people. We need to have the courage and, and principal position to work with 
their convictions, to give them space. Young people across the globe march on issues of climate change. They fight for social justice and they manage to reshape the international agenda. And it makes sense. And I know they've done so in Egypt too, time and time again. And I know AUC nurtures this generation of thinkers and potential leaders that give to their country whilst they build it and they provide constructive criticism. But it also means if we want to work with the power of young voices through them and with them, that they need to be given a greater say in policy and in politics. This means also we need to invest a significantly greater share in their education, in the relevance of their learning in public schooling and through private schooling. But of course, also have a clear eye towards what youth employment means, which types of jobs are required, who are the graduates or who are the people that graduate from a vocational training school and the millions and millions who are left without a Taujihi, uh, I forgot what it's called uh, in Egypt, but you'll remind me later, um, with any form of a certificate from high school or middle school, that we also provide them with opportunities that give them dignity. Ultimately, the yearning of people is always for dignity. And this is where we can potentially turn the tide because systemic challenges require also structural solutions. As we all know, we, can, we cannot fix the foundations of a house by only fitting new window blinds. We need to dig deep. We need to work on the scaffolding. We need to address anything that is structural and then we'll deal with the the beautification aspects of the renovation. So there are numerous challenges. I'm never pretending sitting from actually my one of my children's bedrooms here um, uh, in Corona time being also uh, in, in semi lockdown. Um, I'm never pretending that it's easy. There is no magic wand, but I do believe in the power of individuals in choices made in the power of persuasion in the power of data and learning from the past. And the great medieval philosopher Ibn Rushd wrote about catharsis. He believed that it makes souls become tender and prompts them to accept virtues and virtues fuel human action. We have what it takes to make the change. Complexity is what makes the world go round, but humanity is what makes the difference. Thank you so much. Uh, Minister Kag, uh, thank you for uh, that very broad and, and I thought very, very thoughtful overview of, of the um, complexities uh, and, and the multidimensional nature uh, that this pandemic uh, poses. If I could perhaps start by asking you, um, you mentioned several times in your remarks uh, the challenge of governance. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is a challenge that confronts both uh, developing and developed nations uh, alike. And this, this has prompted what I think is a very interesting debate about how the pandemic is changing modes mm -hmm. of governance, w whether that relates to the role of the state to alleviate uh, the social and economic costs of the pandemic that, that articulated quite uh, eloquently, or even on the issue of globalization, the, the fact that now supply chains are under stress, the fact that now there is a competition to obtain the vaccine uh, early enough for, uh, for one's citizens. If I could ask if, for you to give us your perspective uh, on these debates, how does the pandemic force us to rethink prevailing modes of governance? Yeah, woo. Oh, I have to think of where, where I'm starting. Um, prevailing modes of governance. Well, one of them is for sure, um, we need to, uh, if you look at it from, um, from partnerships, uh, we need to rethink how all different actors in our ecosystem of policy and politics can be uh, playing their role and take on their responsibility. There cannot be any singular free rider and the corona crisis starting as a health crisis is an interesting one through the lens of public health, global public goods, 
access to treatment or access to a vaccine, and it teaches you equity right up in front. It cannot be that in the Netherlands, we will have access to a vaccine, whilst a poor farmer in Zambia will have none. And so I'm using the lens of COVID for one. I believe that uh, we need to reset uh, both the international order. I, um, I'm firmly convinced that the election of President Biden uh, elect is a, is a wonderful start, that we use the international system, be it from the IMF, the bank, but also the UN, uh, as a starting for a, a point where at a global platform, all countries are equal and we tackle global challenges conjointly. And at the same time, there needs to be a greater acceptance and role from a, from a value-based perspective for the private sector uh, in the development. And I'm using the example of, the, of, of COVID, of a vaccine, in the distribution of a vaccine, in the pricing of a vaccine. But thirdly, and that's often forgotten in the way the, the international system was, of course, um, uh, established, it's all about citizens. The UN Charter is, starts with we, the people, but it's been in a way uh, captured by government, governments, because that's how we run internationally the system. But people, individual voices want to be heard, want to be seen. We see that in climate action, we see it in the demonstrations, we see it in public unrest. So the so social contract, whichever country you're at, asks also for a rethinking. Citizens are much more uh, critical. They are. They have access to knowledge at the same time. I don't know if it's the same in Egypt, where we become a nation of 17 million virologists. Everybody is suddenly an expert. Anybody who can read and write goes to the internet and has an opinion on the virus. So this is a big task for any government. You cannot rely anymore on on your traditional status, saying, "Well, we've got the we've got the scientists. We'll do the plan and trust us." The erosion of trust between citizens and governments or public duty holders or bearers is so big that we're all in a big search, I think, for a reset of this relationship. And it starts with transparency. It starts with delivery on rights and services, but it also ends with accountability. And the accountability question is the big one. Now, I live in a dem democratic country. Accountability happens at the elections. In many other countries, this is not the way the story ends. Uh, thank you, Minister Cog. Uh, before I, I, I invite uh, our participants to uh, present their questions, um, perhaps I if I can ask you a, a follow-up question on how the pandemic has influenced uh, the perception of the EU towards the region. So, the, the onset of COVID-19 is a seismic event, of course, uh, and, and I think you've, you've laid out uh, very articulately the, the immensity uh, of the challenge. To, to what extent has uh, the, this development influenced how the EU relates to the region, whether in terms of its political engagement uh, and its assistance programs and partnership programs uh, with the Middle East? Well, um, let me start on a sobering note. I think most countries uh, and the EU as a political economic entity uh, have been preoccupied with their own existence, with uh, the impact of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the virus on their own citizens and the ability the, of the EU to actually function as an EU. Uh, we've been exposed in not working as efficiently at the, at the outset of the crisis uh, on this health issue that crosses borders, of course, but it's, 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 been a, it's been a challenge. So I'm sorry to say, I do not think that there's been a big think or a, a big debate in Brussels or anywhere else uh, about relationships beyond the EU. Uh, it's maybe not the right way to do it, but I think people have been pre predominantly preoccupied with themselves. Even worse, I would say, it's been very nationally focused. It's only now that we're starting to look beyond our borders again, but within the EU, how can we tackle the challenges? What can be the global response of the EU? The conferences have been held, but the mindset has not been so. At the same time, there's a great recognition we need to work through the IMF, the World Bank, and of course, the partnership and association agreements the EU has to really shore up and help countries in the Middle East and North Africa deal with the impact of this crisis. And this is a multi-year issue. I'm personally particularly concerned about the debt 
and the sustainability of the significant debt that is mounting in many countries in the Middle East and North Africa, because that's where vulnerability really kicks, kicks in. And this is something where we are in discussions with the IMF and others, but citizens of the region do not feel that. You can't tell anyone if they're, sure, if they're hungry, well, the EU is talking to the IMF. Uh, thank you, Minister Cog. Uh, if I could ask members of the audience uh, if there are any questions uh, to be posed to the minister. Please, Mr. Uh, Fouad Yunus. Hello? I'm not sure if you heard the question, Minister Cog. <coughs> no, I, I was not able to hear it. Okay. Apologies. I cannot hear you. Could somebody else read the question or bring you a different mic? Uh, Mrs. Minister, can we <clears throat> expect more flexibility in the position of European creditors towards uh, African countries severely affected by COVID-19? Yeah, it's an, uh, uh, it's uh, obviously uh, it's the right question to ask. Uh, I certainly hope so, because I think if we are not in a position to extend greater flexibility around, uh, around the difficult economic choices that certain countries have to make, we only feed greater instability. At the same time, as you know, there needs to be a certain level of conditionality dependent on the country and dependent on where they wish to uh, invest or spend uh, their, uh, their, their own financing. Uh, and of course, also, if, they're, if we're talking about loans or, uh, or soft loans or an extension of credit schemes, we want to know, of course, what is being spent on. It can't be arms. Uh, corruption needs to be tackled. And then you come to the heart of governance again. What are the reforms needed uh, alongside? But we do not want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. But the political mood, as you know, is fairly conservative. Uh, it is inward looking. Uh, and there needs to be a big push uh, from within Europe uh, as well to, to remind many people that we are in this together. Uh, with the corona crisis, the, the economic consequences of this crisis, the weakest link will, uh, will topple the strongest part of the chain. So we are also in favor of an extension of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of debt support through the IMF and others. We're not the biggest creditor, but we also want to see the private sector and China, of course, in on this conversation. Uh, we are not the largest creditors anymore. Um, so Minister Kag, that, that uh, brings up another question, I think related to uh, the role of international multilateral efforts to uh, address the challenges posed by COVID-19. Uh, th throughout your career, you have been involved in addressing many of the very pressing issues uh, facing the Middle East, uh, issues of women and gender, education, peace and security, uh, weapons of mass destruction, refugees. Uh, and I think that's very telling uh, in, in terms of the scope of your involvement in multilateral efforts to address these problems. H how would you assess um, the impact of international multilateral institutions and frameworks to deal with the challenges posed by the pandemic, both globally and regionally? Yeah, well, I think the international system is much overdue for reform, uh, but the political there's an absence always of political will. Uh, I think most member states would agree that there's a need to reform the Security Council, 
the entire UN system, uh, when we're looking at the bank and the IMF even, but there's an absence of political will. What we can do is not be captured or hijacked by this reform agenda, try to reform bits of the system that can deliver best for people, for citizens, be supportive of government, gov governments, but not be blind to, to their shortcomings. So set the bar high, um, but we need to invest in the system as well. I've often been troubled myself, um, being a Dutch citizen, but being an international civil servant, that uh, many a Western government as well had a high list of demands, but ultimately when it came to the moment of choice and change, and the same for the G77 or the African group or whichever constituency you spoke to, everybody at the end of the day would represent only the part of the puzzle that they felt strongest about, and that doesn't add up. So if we firmly believe that we are, we are around global changes, we need to tackle the transnational challenges together, climate change, poverty, insecurity, or conflict, there needs to be a determining factor. So I'm hopeful that this round, the UN again is back to the fore, that it will not be underfunded, but that the system itself is also allowed to operate and to deliver. And some of the messages then will not be popular. Human rights, conflict, uh, Security Council resolutions need to be passed. But the Security Council has been uh, dysfunctional for a number of years now. It's always been a power play, but it's now become dysfunctional. So I live in hope, but in the meantime, people can't wait. And the Middle East and North Africa region in particular, if there's one region that has been cited and named in God knows how many Security Council resolutions, but things haven't changed. Clearly there's also a role for regional actors, uh, regional configurations, and I would believe plurilateral solutions. A number of countries teaming up, a number of investors teaming up. The World Economic Forum offers a wonderful platform for many people to think up solutions, find the investors and drive the change. Um, nobody owns the solution, but we can propose it and mobilize sufficient political support with the investors as appropriate. Peace is built, peace is not invented. Of the limited time uh, we have you with us, um, I have one uh, question uh, from uh, one of our online uh, participants about uh, the prospects of regional uh, cooperation. Um, and that raises a, an important issue about uh, whether the EU can play a role in fostering greater regional cooperation um, uh, to address the challenges uh, of the pandemic. Well, um, well, it should. It, uh, it sort of could or woulda, <laughs> could if it would, but um, there are two things. The EU needs to uh, find its own role, I think, to a gr at a greater political level. And I'm saying this uh, as an EU citizen, also as a minister, but I'm also the leader of uh, the most pro-European party uh, in our parliament. Uh, so I think the EU should do a lot more. It can do more. I believe also there's a yearning, particularly from the Middle East and North Africa, for the EU to play a role. But that comes at a, at a price and it comes, uh, you have to make choices. And that's where uh, it gets much harder. Um, the regional cooperation has been very difficult, as you know, in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, you see it through the, econ uh, the economic ties. But if we look now at conflicts in Libya or you look at Syria, I don't see much, I see cooperation, but not necessarily of the same actors towards the same goals and it's split. So you would need to look to the, uh, to the capital of the Arab League and also start that discussion again there, but maybe there's different ways to work it. Thank you. If there are no uh, questions from the audience, perhaps uh, I could pose uh, a final question um, for, for you to, to consider. Um, the, the, and it relates to how uh, the pandemic has changed the internal politics in Europe as they relate to the, the Middle East. Now, of course, we've all seen how uh, the inflow of migrants and refugees uh, from the Middle East to the EU has had a dramatic impact on the political discourse uh, in EU countries towards uh, the region, uh, and eventually uh, to uh, certain instances of policy changes uh, in some countries towards the region. 
do, do you feel that the pandemic has accelerated the wave of uh, populism within some EU countries and therefore will possibly affect the outlook of the EU towards the region? Well, it's hard to tell because like the Middle East and North Africa, we're not a monolithic block. We are members of the EU, but different cultures, different origins. Um, you know that countries to the east, at least the east of the Netherlands, have different views uh, around migration. Um, foreigners, uh, it often intertwines. Um, I think the pandemic has actually caused for a bit of a political pause. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there is a tremendous uh, tendency now to look inwardly, worry about one's own economic survival, which is very legitimate. People are worried about their job losses and their families and they, they, they're scared. So there is not much of a debate at the moment around migration, including refugee flows, but come elections, it will happen again because it's also an easy ticket uh, to look away from the other more pressing domestic issues. So I fear that it will rise again but it's not rooted in the reality. Um, Minister Kag, uh, uh, allow me to thank you for presenting us with what I thought was not only a very insightful analysis, but a very compelling one. Um, th thank you for sharing your perspective with us. Um, on behalf of the university, on behalf of the Nadia Yunus family, uh, on behalf of everybody here, uh, allow me to thank you for taking the time Please join me in thanking Minister Cog for her time with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, I will add my thanks. Francis Richard, I don't know if I'm on camera or not. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating. We're honored also this evening by the presence of the Dutch ambassador, uh, Schapfeld, first time we've met. What great pleasure for me. Thank you very much. And Ambassador Sir Jeffrey Adams and Lady Mary Emma are here. And do we also, uh, uh, the Austrian ambassador was going to come, and but I've not, we've not had the pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. And to our other honored guests, thank you for coming together. It really is a great pleasure. Um, could we, have, if uh, the minister is still available, I don't know, we were hoping to get a photo. Is that possible? So you have I'm her there. Good, thank you very much. Can we do that? Okay, with the uh, Eunice family to start with uh, uh, Fuad and Nahed and Malik. There are no other family members or are there? Your daughters and others? Yeah. If we get this right, <laughs> Looks a bit pharaonic, my head there. Photos make it official. Thank you all very much.